Ok. Gong jing da da san ting wei si fa wei ji yi jie dong shan jing zhuan miao fa lun dao dao wo men ru he liao shang tuo si li ku de la su zhan wu Will the Sangha with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non birth. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sucheto ye alahati san miao san puto che. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa. Fai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yi Wo Jin Jian Wen De Shou Chu Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Buddha's Bodhisattva's Mirable Master and all good knowing advisors, welcome back to our weekly exploration of uh, the Dharma using the Medicine Master Buddha Sutra as our foundation. We will recite Medicine Master Buddha's name seven times before we get into today's class. Namo quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha Namo Quelling Disasters Lending Life 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 Medicine Master Buddha, Medicine Master does come one, Medicine Master does come one, Medicine Master does come one, Medicine Master does come one. Hello everyone, welcome back and um, because we are having our Flower Dormant Sutra or Avatasaka's uh, recitation uh, today downstairs in the Buddha Hall. We have less people joining us online. Some of them I just asked. Um, I saw them in the Buddha Hall reciting. Okay, let me get today's slides up. Um, today I have, uh, we are continuing with our exploration of the heavens. And uh, we have some really good stories to share. Okay, let me advance the slide. 
So where are we right now? We ask, if you look at your screen, number 6 to 11, those are the six heavens of the desire realm. Today, we are at the heaven of the four kings. Okay, and what are the heaven of the four kings? Okay, let's see. This is what Shufu has to say from our publication called the Ten Dharma Realms. So Shufu says, our world is located under the first of the six heavens of the desire realm, and this is known as the heaven of the four heavenly kings. This heaven which is directly above us is governed by these heavenly kings. So this heaven has four kings and is named after them. Shufu says it is situated halfway up Mount Sumeru. The bottom half of Mount Sumeru is within the human realm, while the top half is above the heaven of the four heavenly kings, which means that the this heaven is right in the middle of Mount Sumeru in terms of, uh, of height. So apparently physically it's, it's closest to us and um uh and even the how you say the bottom part of Mount Sumeru uh, is within the human realm. Uh, does that mean that humans can can get there? I think maybe if you're in a different continent, maybe like in Uttara uh, Kuru, maybe uh, there might be a possibility, but definitely I don't think from Jambu Vidpa uh, we can. Yeah. All right. So why are they called the four heavenly kings? There is one king for each direction of Mount Sumeru. That means the east, west, north, and south. Or rather, there should be north, south, east, and west. So they each govern the four continents that make up our world. And our world means uh, the, our human world according to uh, the Dharma, not according to uh, modern, uh, normal, regular geography. Okay, regular geography, if you, you know, like you look at a map of the world uh, with Mount Everest and all the different continents, that would be number two, Jambu Dvitpa. But um, in terms of the Buddhist cosmos, there are other humans, uh, human beings living on the on three other continents that are not accessible to regular hu uh, human beings. So to the north, there's Uttara Kuru. And in our last few classes, we know that in Uttara Kuru is the only realm where they have a fixed lifespan. Everyone else, uh, every other form of existence, the lifespan is unfixed. So Uttara Kuru is very special in that. Then in the south, number two is us, Jambu Vidpa. Then in the east, there's Purwa Videha. And in the west, there's Apara Gordaniya. Um, so each of the kings handle a different part of the human realm. And Shufu says, if you were to go into detail, this discussion would never end. It's kind of true. Uh, there are so many uh, stories to share because the this heaven, the heaven of the four great kings or the heaven of the four kings, uh, because of its proximate, proximity to earth, um, they have a lot of, how you say, um, uh, they are closest to Earth, not just in terms of uh, distance, but also in terms of affairs and uh, encounters. All right. Okay. Let's move on to more about the heaven. So how long is the lifespan of the beings in this heaven? Shufu says they have a lifespan of 500 years. Every Basically, every uh, time the Buddha mentions the lifespan, is always, the lifespan for this heaven is very consistent. It's always 500 years. But it's not 500 years as how we humans understand. Okay, it's 500 years, but not the same as 500 years on earth. Why? Because one day and one night in the heaven is equal to 50 years on earth. So if you have a friend who dies and they go to the heaven, you know, they get reborn in the heaven. But before he dies, he promises you that he'll, he or she will come back and, and tell you where they go if they go to the heaven. They go to this heaven, you know, and the first day they, they check into uh, <laughs> maybe the hotel, but not, not a hotel, a mansion, you know, and uh, they have a meal. They eat, they actually eat in this heaven. They walk around, they explore the place. They, they get tired, they sleep and they wake up the next day and they realize, oh, you know, uh, I've got to go tell my friend that I've been reborn in this heaven. They come back to earth and 50 years have gone by. That's, that, that's what it means. One day and one night in the heaven is equal to 50 years on earth. And um, some of us might be dead 
by then. So they come back only to find, oh, my old friend is dead. Oh, sorry. So Shufu says, figure it out. How many years on earth is 500 years in the heaven of the four heavenly kings? One of their days is 50 human years. How many human years is 365 of their days? Shufu says, if you know math, you can figure it out. So any of you with a calculator, this is what you do. So there's 500 heavenly years, right? And every heaven year, heavenly year has 365 heavenly days. So you get, take the number 500, you multiply it by 365, and what you get? You get 182,500 heavenly days. Okay, so that's 182,500 heavenly days. And we know that one day, one heavenly day is equivalent to 50 human years. So you take that number, 182,500, you multiply it by 50, and you get 9,125,000 human years. So basically, um, the lifespan in the heavens is equivalent to approximately about just over 9 million human years. That's a very long time. You get to see dinosaurs come and go and, and things like that. Okay. Um, okay, now we are mo we are getting information from a publication called The Buddhist Cosmos. And here it says, like the higher central heavens, the principal cause for one to be reborn in the company of the four great kings is said to be generosity and morality. So to get to this heaven, as well as the other five heavens, depends on the degree of how generous you are, uh, how much you practice giving, and how much you hold to the precepts. Okay, so if you hold it at the uh, uh, at a certain level, um, you can get to this heaven. And it says, however, this being the lowest of the heavens, meaning in the uh, of all the heavens, actually this is the lowest. It becomes the destination of someone, a person who gives with a self-seeking mind, thinking only of the reward to be enjoyed in the hereafter. So that's basically a lot of people. Um, you know, some people they do charity. Um, but they, the reason they do it is because they um, uh, of the recognition. Sometimes it can it, it doesn't have to be a selfish reason. For example, uh, like you do charity, but you want people to know to bring more attention to the charity itself, for example. So it can be for wholesome reasons. Uh, but basically you do it because you, uh, how you say, you do not mind the rewards. Okay, you, you you do good things and you may understand that, oh, uh, by doing good, I shall get good in return. Uh, everyone uh, benefits. It could be that. Okay, so the happy, happiness of even the lowest devas in this heaven is said to make kingship among humans appear miserable. So you can take any human who whose life doesn't need to be like the rich, you know, rich people but someone whose life is so uh, uh, blissful, okay, either they, they, they get everything they want, um, they're always happy, um, you know, their life is filled with pleasures. Um, it cannot even compare to the most miserable deva from the heavens. That's such, that's, that's the contrast between us and them. Yeah, no comparison, okay. In this heaven, there are found many gold, silver, and crystal palaces in which the devas live. So their, their palaces are made from precious materials. But not all the gods uh, are equal. Um, they have various, because they get there through their blessings. So it's just like on earth, you know, we have humans and we have a wide variety. Some are extremely rich, some are extremely poor. It's the same thing in the heavens, but their poor is not like our poor where you're kind of miserable. Um, so it, say, it is said that some have a retinue of attendants. So when you're born in that heaven, you have your palace waiting for you and your palace are filled with, um, I think, magical. They're not, I'm not sure, it's, it's not really mentioned. Um, they are filled with attendants who serve serve you. Anything you want, they, they get it done. Um, what do they do? Uh, 
I haven't really found any <laughs> reference. Um, but that's how it is. They have a lot of attendance, but some are born in an empty mansion. So you get a very nice house, but you have no one, uh, you have no attendance. So who is that? Okay. If you look at our screen, there's someone there called King Payasi. Do you remember the story of King Payasi, which we did a few months ago? King Payasi, if you remember or you recall, was the king who found out about doing good deeds from the Buddha, from the Buddha, from a monk, or one of the uh, either from the Buddha himself or one of the uh, Buddha's uh, monks. I don't remember which. So anyway, he he then decided to do charitable deeds. But instead of doing it himself, he appointed uh, one of his trusted uh, servants to do it. And at first, what he did was he only gave out things that he wouldn't eat himself. So food that was coarse and not, uh, not delicacies. Um, and so he heard his servant uh, kind of not complain, but the servant said, um, may something like in the afterlife, I do not want to be reborn with my king again. And this puzzled him. And when he asked his servant, his servant said, it's because you give things that you yourself do not want to eat. Do not want, you give clothes that you yourself do not want to wear because they're not fine enough. And um, the result of this giving will not be so good. So I do not want to be born with uh, with you again because, you know, your your how you say, you might go to a lesser place, whereas I want to, my aspirations are higher. So when the king heard that, he said, oh, I didn't know. So he started, he told his attendant, he said, okay, then start giving out the same food that I like to eat and give out fine clothes. So it, that's what the attendant did. And uh, upon their deaths, the attendant went to the heaven of the 33, which is the heaven above this heaven of the four kings. But King Payasi, um, was reborn in the heaven of the four kings, and he was. It is said that he was born in an empty mansion. Yeah, so that's the story. Okay, um, so not all the gods live up to their full lifespan of five hundred years. Uh, the Buddha says that there are two kinds of gods who die prematurely. One is um, in Pali, the name, the term is Kida. Padosika Devas or those corrupted by play. And the second category are the Mano Padosika Devas. Mano is a Pali word for the mind and it means corrupted by mind. What does that mean? Okay. Um, this is where it gets a bit interesting. Okay. So what does it mean to be corrupted by play? So these are the Devas who because they have so much pleasure in the heavens, you know, they enjoy themselves, uh, they enjoy themselves so much that they just spend all their time laughing and playing around. And, you know, the equivalent here would be, I don't know, uh, in the winter going for skiing in the summer, going to the, um, the best beaches around the world, you know, always, um, enjoying themselves flying here and there, shopping, uh, movies and, and, and whatnot, playing, uh, sports. So in the case of these devas, they get so consumed in their enjoyment that they actually forget about eating. They forget about their food. So in their absorption of their great enjoyment, they forget whether they have eaten or not. And when they, um, how you say, when they miss a single meal, it's not like us. If we miss a single meal, we get hungry, but you know, we don't die. We just, you know, um, wait until the next time. And then we, we eat and we are okay. But apparently for the gods in this heaven, because of the nature of their bodies, which is different from us, if they miss their meal time. Although it is said that although they eat and drink immediately afterwards, they will still die. Okay. And why is that? Well, okay. Apparently, um, there are two components to the body. One is the heat element and the other one is the material element. Okay. So I guess you could say, uh, one is the chi 
and one is the the physical body itself. Okay, uh, maybe that might be a term that's more, um, uh, uh, how you say, uh, uh, identifiable perhaps. Okay, so one is the heat element, maybe um, yeah, the heat element, and the other one is a physical element. So for men, for okay, for men and women, for human beings, okay, our heat element is said to be delicate but our physical element is strong. So that's why we can go without nourishment. Uh, like I, I guess we can go without food for up to seven, 14 days uh, for regular people. And uh, then we can go without water normally, what, three days, four days uh, maximum. Uh, but when we continue eating and drinking, we can regain our strength, okay? And that's because although we our heat element is delicate, our physical element is strong, okay? But for the gods, it's, it's different. It's the opposite. Uh, they have very, very strong heat element, okay? Maybe that like their chi is really, really strong, or maybe chi is not correct. Uh, I don't know if it's chi. So their heat element is very, very strong, but their material bodies are very, very delicate. So they cannot endure even missing a single meal. Yeah. So the Buddha said, uh, or actually one of the commentaries said that it is just like a red or blue lotus. You pluck it and you place it on in a hot afternoon uh, under the midday sun on a hot rock. So any flower as delicate as a lotus is, you know, you pluck it middle of the day under the hot sun and you place it on a hot surface, it very quickly wilts. So that's how the Buddha explained how to understand um, the, the, a very fragile uh, physical body. So the Buddha says, in the same way, these devas pass away and cannot remain. Hmm. So that's devas who are corrupted by play. Okay, then there are devas corrupted by mind. Okay, what are devas corrupted by mind? Okay, this is also very interesting. He says, these are devas who look at each other and they feel jealous, they have excessive envy, and this envy then leads to their minds being corrupted by anger. And the Buddha says when their minds are corrupted by anger, their bodies and their minds become exhausted, and conse consequently they pass away from that plane. So anyone, or I can't say, I speak for myself, um, I remember growing up, Sometimes I will get very angry. Uh, like my parents would say, you can't do that. And I get very angry and I throw a temper tantrum and I run to my room and cry. And it's very exhausting. I will cry and then I always remember just falling asleep after that. So anger uh, for the devas is said to be very um, exhausting for their bodies. So there is a story um, in one of the commentaries and this is how it goes. It says, in the heavens one day, there was, there was this uh, young young god who wanted to go celebrate a festival. Uh, so yes, they do celebrate, they have festivals in the heavens. You know, it is the heavens. So they have very nice things to do. So he wanted to go celebrate a festival. And so he was on, he went, he was, uh, he rode to the festival on a carriage. So along the way, as he was riding in his carriage, some devas were walking to the festival. So I guess this comes back to the devas with different levels of blessings. So one of the devas who was walking saw this deva riding on a carriage and that made him jealous because why? He, he didn't have a carriage, but this uh, young, young uh, upstart has a carriage. So he started complaining. He said, that miserable wretch, there is he going along, puff up with rapture to the bursting point as if he had never seen a festival before. <laughs> so that's how he tried to put down the, the other god who was running in the carriage. So this god heard the other god turn around and saw that, oh, this other god is, uh, is jealous and angry of me. Um, why? Because the Buddha says, angry people are very easy to recognize. So what did this uh, God in a carriage do? He became angry 
and he shouted back, he said, What have you got to do with me, you hot-headed fellow? My prosperity was gained entirely by my own materials works. It has nothing to do with you. So basically, he's shouting back, Why don't you mind your own business? You know, what I have uh, was through my own blessings. You know, what has it got to do with you? Okay, so, so the Buddha says, if one of these um, um, devas get angry, but the other remains unangered, okay? The Buddha says, if, you, if one gets angry, but the other person uh, does not get angry, he says, the one that does not ang get angry actually protects the other person from passing away. Okay? So, people get angry at you, okay, assuming you're God, and you don't get angry in return. You protect the other person, not just the other person, but yourself too. Okay. Then the Buddha says, but if both get angry, the anger of one will become the condition for the anger of the other, and both will pass away with their harems weeping. This is the, the retinue. They get very sad. And apparently this is uh, how uh, karma in the heaven works. They are mutually reinforcing anger reaches such intensity that it consumes, uh, it says here, the heart base and destroys the extremely delicate material body. So the bodies are so delicate, um, like I said, so subtle in the heavens that they cannot stand um, anger in that sense. Yeah. So if you are angry, you're an angry person, but you do a lot of blessings, but you still like to get angry and you go to the heavens, uh, this is what happens. Your anger comes back and gives you uh, gives yourself a short life. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, let's move on. Uh, at, at this point, do we have any questions? Or uh, you don't even know what to ask? Okay, we'll see. Okay, if you have questions, unmute your mic or just uh, type into the chat box. Okay, so when you are born in this heaven, you're born by spontaneous birth. Okay, what does that mean? It means like you're waking up from a dream. Compared to humans born through uh, womb birth, you're born, you don't know anything, you can't walk, you can't take care of yourself for the first few years, you can't cook, you know, uh, you will die if you're left alone. You have to learn how to talk, you have to learn how to think, you have to learn how to do everything, you know, and it takes a long, long time before you can function in a way that's actually responsible if you ever get to that point at all uh, but if you're born in the heavens it's not like that at all you it's like waking up from a dream you can talk you can move you can you're like a fully functioning uh, person so it's very convenient okay uh, this heaven the heaven of 33 um, is, uh, excuse me sorry this heaven the heaven of the four kings is the first line of defense in protecting the heaven of the 33 from the Asuras. So we won't go into detail now. Uh, I'll keep that story when we get to the heaven of the 33. The heaven of the 33 or the Triumph Trimsha heaven is uh, the heaven that's above um, heaven of the four kings. And it is said that the, the, the uh, great battles happen between the heavenly beings there and the Asuras. Um, so this heaven is the first line of defense, all right? And famous, before we get to the actual four, four kings themselves, okay? Uh, there are two very famous inhabitants of this king, uh, of this heaven, who are Suriya and Chandima, who are the devas of the sun and the moon, respectively. So Suri, Suriya is the deva of the sun, and Chandima is the deva of the moon. And they are considered as um, from this heaven. It's also said that both these devas are stream enterers, that means uh, srotapanas, stream enterers or first stage arhats, and they attain that state from sharing the Maha Saya, sorry, Maha Samaya Sutta. What is that? The Maha Samaya Sutta is also known as the great meeting or the great assembly because how it happens is that uh, the buddha with 500 of his monks were meditating and then the gods wanted to see the buddha and his 500 arhat monks uh, so the buddha helped bring all of them together to one place 
and the Buddha started listing down all the various uh, gods from, from there. So it's like a who's who from the heavenly realm. Like everyone who is someone from the heavenly realm uh, came to see the Buddha. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, it's kind of like saying um, maybe, uh, let's see who's uh, famous. Mm, say the, 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 the British royal family, for example, and uh, all the all the different aristocrat families from all around the world are there. And then all the famous movie stars from every country, they come, all the most famous singers in the world from every country come, and they all come to one place. Kind of like that. Okay, so uh, Suri, uh, Surya and Chandima, when they heard this sutra, who the Buddha just reciting all the names of all these uh, notable uh, gods from all the different heavens, uh, they they became first stage arhats. Yeah. Okay. So I have a story about them. Um, and um, okay. Before I get to the story, just one quick, uh, one more quick note. So to us, we see the sun and the moon. Okay. Uh, the sun is hot, fiery, and the moon is cool. Uh, full of dust, but to the gods, the it appears differently. So to Surya, the sun is actually, uh, I think it's a, let me see, it's a Devata. I'm not sure if it's a Devata, which means it could be a her. Anyway, uh, to the god, Suryima, Surya, the palace of the sun is crystal, not fire like how we see it. And the moon appears as silver. Okay, so precious metal. Precious uh, materials. Okay, so what is this story about? Okay, this story begins with um, there was a young novice monk called Pandita, and Pandita was a student of Shariputra. So while following Shariputra on an arms round, and this was only on the eighth day of his ordination of as a novice monk. So it was a young, very young, uh, I think. At that time, it would be below 18 or below 21 years old, definitely. And only on his eighth day as a novice monk, when they went for arms round, uh, he saw, oh, sorry, excuse me. He saw um, people working in the field. And uh, basically they passed, they went to the village and they saw farmers, there were farmers working in the wheel, uh, there were tradespeople uh, making arrowheads, and there were carpenters or wood workers who were making um, wheels for wagons. So Pandita thought to himself, he said, if farmers can channel water to go where they wish, if fletchers can shape stone into arrowheads, what are fletchers? Fletchers are people who make uh, bow and arrows. Um, fletchers, or maybe just arrows, but they're known as fletchers. And he said, and wheel right, wheel rights can fashion wood into wagon wheels. Why cannot I shape the mind? Okay, so that thought occurred to him. When he saw trades people fashioning things, diverting water, he said, why can't I do the same with my mind? So earnestly, <clears throat> he asked. Mirabal Shariputra for permission so that he could go back to his hut and continue his meditation. So Shariputra said yes and said, um, and this was before they had received food. So Shariputra said yes and he promised to bring the young boy uh, some food when he had finished his arms run. So it is said that uh, this young boy made very rapid progress in his meditation and before the morning was over, he had already attained the first three fruits. What are the first three fruits? I think this would be the third stage of um, our hardship. He, he became a once returner. Wait, um, one, one, uh, he became the third stage our heart. Okay. And the Buddha knew what was going on. From his psychic power, the Buddha understood what was going on. And so did the gods. So what did the gods do? The gods set up guard on the, on the, on the, around the area where this young monk uh, was meditating so that he will not 
it is said he will not be disturbed even by the sound of a falling leaf. Uh, so if you practice, you, you get the protection of the gods. So when Shariputra came, Venerable Shariputra came back from his arms round uh, with some food for the young monk, the Buddha purposely engaged Sariputra in, conver in conversation so that uh, the young monk would have more time to meditate. And this delay in Shariputra going to see the young monk enabled this young monk to progress through the third stage of Arahatship and he became a fully fledged Arahat. And he's just a young boy. Yeah, a young man. Young man or young boy. Uh, we are not too sure. But definitely very young. But by the time, by the time this had happened, uh, it was almost afternoon, and um, uh, monks, Theravada monks especially, uh, who are very strict with the precepts, they don't eat afternoon. We usually don't eat afternoon. That's why if you go to any monastery, um, we usually eat about. We have a meal offering about ten thirty. Um, and we begin our meal by about 10.45. Uh, so when you go on arms round, you go early in the morning, depending on how far the village is. And you come back, you distribute the food, and you eat before 11, and you normally finish definitely before 12. Definitely before 12. Okay, so, um, so because the sun was going to be almost overhead, to prevent the young Arhat from going hungry, out of compassion, Surima, Suri, excuse me, Surya and Chandima, who are the, the, the who control whose mansions are the sun and the moon, actually stop their uh, palace from moving. And so to give enough time to the new Arhat, enough time to finish his meal. So that's the story about the sun and the moon god. Okay. All right, let's move on. Okay, so this heaven of the four kings is ruled by the four heavenly kings who are also known as protectors of the world. What world? Uh, the world uh, uh, of the world that includes us, our world. The names of these gods are really more like titles of an office. So they're more like a position, like say a general manager rather than uh, a person because when one of these passes away a new one takes his a new one appoints them could say like the ceo of the company uh, is uh, chakra saka or lord chakra who is king of Tri triya trimsha or the heaven of the 33 he's responsible for appointing um, uh, the gods to these four positions the four of them each rule over a different race of beings. And this different race of beings serve as their army and their retinue. Yeah. And it is said that when Shakyamuni Buddha was in his mother's womb, before he was born as a prince, um, these four gods were his uh, bodyguards, they were his guardians. And upon his birth, they presented him to his mom, to, to Queen Maya, the mother. Uh, I have a story about that, but before we go there, let me show you what they look like. Okay, anyone seen the four heavenly kings? You want to see what they look like? Okay, here you go. This is the first one, King of the North, also known as Vaishra, Vaishra Wana. This image is from taken at Tenpian in Kuala Lumpur. So if you go to a uh, I think most Mahayana temples, you will see statues or images of the four heavenly kings. For example, in City TB, we don't have them flanking, and they're usually in front of the Buddha hall, or they protect the four corners of the Buddha hall. At City TB, they are painted on the walls. Yeah, we don't have them as uh, statues, so they're images, painted images. At Tempian, at the entrance of our main um, at the main entrance, you pass by these uh, huge, these are uh, slightly larger than life size. I think they're about maybe seven foot tall, um, but they're on a pedestal that's maybe like three feet. So they're fairly, the, the height of the head, if you're just standing looking at them, it's like maybe 10 feet. 
Um, so this is uh, King Vajrawana. His name means he who hears everything or someone with much learning. So what does he do? He is king of the Yakshas and the Rakshas. So he's king of the the uh, the fearful uh, uh, beings. Yeah. Uh, it is said that he's also in charge of rain. He's often shown holding a parasol. Parasol is kind of like an umbrella or a mongoose. So I'm not sure how large your screen is. Uh, his right hand is holding the, the parasol and his left hand, they show it as a weird looking creature. That's supposed to be a mongoose. Okay. How did he become uh, who he was? Well, in his previous life or one of his previous lives, he was a very rich merchant and he had seven mills that I think processed grains and, and rice. And what he did was one of his meals he allocated to charity for 20,000 years. So all the proceeds from one of his seven meals, um, he gave away free to people who needed uh, uh, food. And he did that for 20,000 years. So that probably means that he was, this was a time when, when human beings had a, a longer lifespan than, than, than now. And because of those blessings that he did, now he's known as the king of the north or king of Uttara, the continent Uttara Kuru. And not only that, but he's also a first stage Arat or a stream enterer. Yeah. And uh, apparently sometimes he's also worshipped as a god of wealth uh, or god of prosperity. I'm not sure how that ties in with the Chinese. In, in you know Chinese culture, we also have a, a god of prosperity or god of wealth. Uh, because I do not know anything about the God of Wealth. I do not know if they are the same person. Um, but there you go. Yeah. Okay. Next king, king of the south, is known as Viru Daka. Uh, his name means he who causes to grow or increase and growth. He's in charge of the Kumbandas and the, and the Pretas or the hungry ghosts. Um, he's also said to be in charge of wind and is often depicted holding a sword. Of the four kings, all right, the king previously, the king of the north, is the one that's featured most in the sutras. And then these other three kings uh, usually do not play such a prominent role. So that's why we have less information about them, uh, because in the sutras, uh, less is said about them. Okay, the next king, uh, known as the king of the east, is uh, I'm not really sure how to pronounce this. Dr uh, Drutarastra. Drutarastra. It means he who upholds uphold, the realm. Uh, he's known as king of the Gandravas and the Putanas. What are Putanas? Putanas are said to be a um, uh, uh, kind of like not really hungry ghosts, but ghosts, but they emit a f very bad stench among them. So they're also known as stinky ghosts. Um, it is said that he protects all beings, not just uh, under his, his retinue. And um, he's usually depicted holding a string instrument, kind of like a guitar, but there's a name for it. Uh, I, I mentioned it in the last, a lute. Yeah, that, that's, that's a lute, kind of. Yeah. And he also guards the, late, the gate leading to the east, eastern continent uh, of Videha. So that's what he does. Okay. And finally, we have uh, King Virupaksa or King of the West. His name means he sees everything or uh, white eyes. He is King of the Dragons. So all the dragons kind of report to him. And the Pisakas. Pisakas are a class of uh, quite close to hungry ghosts. But what they do is they eat uh, the flesh of living beings. Um, and he also, as a king of the four, uh, of the heaven of the four kings, he protects all beings. And he's usually depicted holding a red cord in the shape of a dragon. So if you look at his right hand, he's holding what uh, seems to be like a uh, the, the head of a dragon. Okay. So the uh, coming back to the, the word Pisaka, uh, of, of flesh eater, it is said that this is the same family of Rakshas and Yakshas, 
but they're differentiated because they eat the flesh of human beings. So sometimes they eat the flesh of human beings. Uh, sometimes they, they, they uh, how you say, they don't literally eat the flesh of human beings, but they feed off the energy of human beings. And that's why they belong more in the realms of ghosts. And uh, they say that you, if you want to look for one, you will probably find one near the cemetery or the cremation grounds. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Each of these four kings have has 91 sons and all of them <laughs> share the same name. All of them are named Indra. Uh, based on the sutras, at least three of these kings uh, also have daughters. And uh, let me see, the characters of three of the great kings are not developed yet. So I mentioned this before. So apart from King Vesavana or Vaishravana, who is the uh, king of the north and the lord of the uh, Yakas or the Yakshas, the other kings are not mentioned so much um, in the sutras. Okay, so what else do they do? Okay, this is where it gets interesting. If it's not interesting enough. Okay, one of the chief duties is to perform regular inspections of the human world on behalf of the gods of the 33. The gods of the 33 is uh, where Lord Chakra is, which is Triumph Trimsha Heaven. Four times every month on the quarters of the moon, the 33 devas of uh, Tavam Timsa, this is the Pali spelling, uh, Sanskrit we would call it Triumph Trimsha, sitting in solemn conclave in the Sudama Hall, order the four great kings to report on conditions in the human world. So think of it like a meeting. They have a very special meeting room called the Sudama Hall. And that's where four times a month, they, um, they order the four great kings to, or the four great kings come and report on what we human beings have been doing. Okay. So what happens during these four days? It says on the half moon days, the four kings send out their ministers. On the new moon, they send out their sons. And on the Uposata day of the full moon, they go out themselves. I know that the Uposata day of the full moon is the first and probably the 15th. Um, or maybe it's just the first. They actually come down themselves. So uh, there's a um, custom, especially people uh, who are Taoists, where at least on the first and the 15th, they observe uh, uh, a vegetarian diet. And this is why, because they also understand that, uh, how you say, records are being taken about your conduct and your behavior on certain days, especially the first and the 15th. So on these days, they, uh, they want to appear to be very well behaved. And <laughs> I'm not sure about other days, but at least on the first and the 15th, they take great pains to uh, uh, to behave themselves and to make sure that the food that they eat does not harm any other living being because you have uh, they understand that you have no right to harm any being just for the sake of uh, your your own greed. Why? Because then the gods will record it down. Uh, so this is what uh, happens. Okay. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so how do they do it? It says, riding in the glorious chariots, they travel from their abodes on Mount Suneru, Suneru or Mount Sumeru, each in its own direction. So they, they fan out to the, their individual continents, to the lands where human beings dwell. They tour the villages, the towns, and the great royal cities. Okay, so no matter where you are, you're not safe. Okay, you think you're in the mountains or in a small village or in a condo right in the heart of the city, um, they know where you are. Okay. So there the great kings ask the local devas. These are the, uh, last week we talked about the Buma devas, the earth devas. So the great kings ask the local devas if the people in that place are honoring mother and father, samanas and brahmins, whether they respect the clan elders, keep the uposata precepts and vigil, and whether they are making meritorious karma. So basically, they go and ask the people who observe you on a daily basis, 
Okay, <laughs> that means the local gods and spirits. To see if you respect your parents or your elders. Um, Samanas means uh, monks and nuns. And Brahmins, people who practice. Uh, do you keep the Uposata precepts? That is, th those means the eight precepts. Okay, that means do you actually practice? Uh, do you sit in meditation or do you recite the Buddha's name? And whether we all make meritorious karma, that means do we practice generosity? Do we help people? Do we try to, for example, like spread the Dharma? Okay, then, okay, so when they come, then the the I, I guess the local devas get a bit excited. They pay homage to their individual great king, and then they start telling them all the things that you have done. It says and inform him that so and so of such and such a clan is doing these good things, and then the great king writes his name on a golden tablet, kind of like Santa Claus. They're recording whether you've been good or bad. Okay, so having completed their tours, the four great kings travel to the Trium Trimsha heaven and present the golden tablets to the devas sitting there in the Sudama hall. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Okay, uh, it's 9.55 here. We've been, I've been talking non-stop for 55 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Or is this too much to, to take in? To, No? Or are you shocked that your actions are not uh, some of the things that you think only you know uh, are not <laughs> are not that secret? And the gods actually know what you're doing? <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. 9.56. Um, okay, I have a story next. Uh, uh, I see it's a sutra. It's a story in the form of a sutra. Let, let's do that. What is the Chatu Maharaja Sutta or known as Messengers of the Gods? This is about how the four heavenly kings come and um, find out about whether human beings have been bad or good and to record down the things that we do. Okay, so this sutra is from the, in the Pali Canon. Um, it's from the Anguttara Nikaya collection uh, number three, and this is Sutta number 37 within that collection. For now, uh, let's look at how the four great kings come and record how humans do their daily stuff. So it says, on the eighth day of the fortnight mendicants, the ministers and counselors of the four great kings wonder about the world, thinking, hopefully most humans are paying due respect to their parents, ascetics, and Brahmins, honoring the elders in their families, observing the Sabbath, this is the, the eight precepts, staying awake and making merit. Staying awake means uh, you, 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 uh, you meditate, not just drink coffee and, and try not to sleep. And on the 14th day of the fortnight, the sons of the four great kings wonder about the world and they think the same thing. Okay, that's, uh, so we, we're not going to go through it again. Okay, what do they think? They say uh, humans paying respect to their parents, to monastics, uh, their elders, their families. Are they practicing the eight precepts and, and uh, making merit, practicing generosity? Okay, he says then, and on the 15th day, Sabbath, the four great kings themselves wonder about the world. So now the, on this particular day, the four great kings personally come down to earth. Okay. If only a few humans are paying due respect to their parents, etc., etc., the whole list, and making merit, then the four great kings ag address the gods of the 33 seated together in the Hall of Justice, or the other word that I use, Sudo, Sudha Dharma. Uh, the other word that I use is also known as the Hall of Justice. So when they report back that human beings are being bad, then the gods of the 33 are disappointed, thinking the heavenly host will dwindle while the demon host will swell. So the gods do care about uh, um, the deeds of, of, of human beings. Okay. But if many humans are paying due respect to their elders, uh, to uh, monastics, 
to their elders and making merry. Then the four great kings address the gods of the 33 seated together in the hall of justice and they say, many humans are paying due respect, etc, etc, making merry. And this makes the gods of the 33 pleased. And they think, oh, the heavenly host will swell while the demon host will dwindle. Okay, so continuing with the sutra. Then, uh, this is all said by the Buddha. And then, so the Buddha continues with the sutra. It says, one upon a time, Saka or Chakra, Lord of Gods, guiding the gods of the 33, recited these words. It says, whoever wants to be like me would observe the Sabbath complete in all eight factors. Okay, what, are the, what is the Sabbath? Again, is the eight precepts. Okay. On the 14th and the 15th days, and the eighth day of the fortnight, as well as on the fourth nightly special days. Okay. Then the Buddha says, But that verse was poorly sung by Chakra, Lord of Gods, not well sung, poorly spoken, not well spoken. Why is that? Chakra, Lord of Gods, is not free of greed, hate, and delusion. Then in, in um, another version of this sutra, uh, it was translated as, Because Chakra, Lord of Gods, is not free or exempt from rebirth, old age and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress. He is not free from suffering. So that's why the Buddha says that um, uh, Lord Chakra spoke poorly when he said that uh, that verse. Okay. And very interestingly, okay, the Buddha says, but for a mendicant who is perfected, with defilements ended, who has completed the spiritual journey, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, achieved their own true goal, utterly ended the fetters of rebirth, and is rightly freed through enlightenment. It is appropriate to say, so the Buddha is describing someone who is an arhat, who has overcome birth and death and suffering. Okay, Then the Buddha says it is appropriate to say, say what? Okay. Whoever wants to be like me would observe the Sabbath complete in all eight factors on the 14th and the 15th days and the eighth day of the fourth night as well as on the fourth nightly special uh, displays. Actually, it should be special days. Then the Buddha says, why is that? Because that mendicant is free of greed, hate and delusion. Or another translation, because the mendicant is exempt free from rebirth, old age and death, from sorrow, from lamentation, pain, sadness and distress, and is exempt from suffering. So I had to read this verse and compare it a few times because the verse is exactly the same. What Lord Chakra said and how the Buddha said a Arhat can say it well is the same. Word for word is the same. So the only difference is that uh, the Buddha says an arhat can say it because an arhat has achieved the ultimate or at least has overcome birth and death. So that's the difference. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, let me see what I want to say. Uh, yep. So it's time um, and we would, uh, I have to go. Any other questions? Ms. Yap says that uh, she used to go to the temple and she's seen these statues at Tan Pian, um, but um, didn't know what they were. Uh, yes, so now you know, Ms. Yap. Uh, and anytime you go to a temple, you can look out for uh, these four kings. Yeah. All right. So next week, we are going to look at the role of the four great kings when the Buddha was born and the prince was born. Yeah. Okay. Let me get the slides for dedication of merit. Okay. I'm going to invite everyone in joining me, putting our palms together. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace, 
with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, our hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave our grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, let's uh, do three bows to the Buddha and to Shufu. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. Bowing respect to the Venerable Master. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. All right, everyone. We'll uh, see you next week, and we'll have more stories about um, the heaven of the four great kings. Okay. Okay, bye-bye.